like you, I'm curious. And what makes me most curious is some of the biggest questions we ask in society. I've broken that down to three questions, because we only have 18 minutes. Who am I? Who do you think I am? And who are you? Some of you may be able to relate to some of these questions. Maybe you've ruminated about them. Perhaps you've asked others to try to answer them for you. And that in itself is a little bit of the problem that we're starting to see. That we ask other people who we are far too often. For the last five years, I've had the opportunity to talk to thousands of young people and attend a lot of different high schools across the province and across the country. And I hear time and time again from young people talking about how I won't choose to wear that shirt if it doesn't have enough likes. I won't share what my weekend was if somebody else posted about their trip to Hawaii because I feel inferior to their life, to their self. And so while I was thinking about giving this talk, I thought about that a lot. And that's where I came up with authority. Who in your life has authority over how you think? and how you feel, and what drives you. Today, just for a little bit of comfort, but I have my books, which is funny because I was not studious in school. I was a C minus student, and here I am giving my first TED talk, holding books. <laughs> so the first book is It's Gonna Be Okay. So that's just for me right now. <laughs> it's just going over here. The next two books have a very personal story attached to them. And what I want to bring up today is what are your stories? What are your experiences? Because truly, the most personable learning that we can have is through story. Ask yourselves, a number of you applauded about being students. Which classes do you care about and which classes do you care about? And I would speculate that that probably has something to do with purpose. Viktor Frankl, somebody you may know, is a legendary psychiatrist. He's legendary for a number of reasons. One that we're most aware of is that he survived German concentration camps. I wasn't alive then, but one of my stories feels like a German concentration camp. I share something in common with far too many people in this world. At age six, my parents became divorced. And at age six, my life drastically changed. Before six years old, outgoing, creative. It's getting me to shut up that was the hard part. I loved to talk. So this is a good place to be. After six, after the divorce, silence. I was brainwashed into silence by a threat. And that threat was, tell anybody and I will kill you. This story is something that we don't talk about enough in society. From age six to my grade 12 year in high school, I endured physical, mental, and sexual abuse on a weekly occurrence. For 10 years of my life, I fought a battle. And it wasn't me against myself. It was me against a parent. Now, some of you may have also had this training in first aid. In first aid, we talk about a term called triage. And triage is the process of dealing with a multi-casualty incident and going from casualty to casualty and identifying the most likely to be saved. Who can we actually help? Let me say, if you're ever in a major disaster, you don't want black tape on you, that's a bad sign. And so for me, in my life, when I was in my concentration camp of home, 
a prisoner in my own house as a child. I triaged my challenges. I broke them down, and I said, which battle do I really need to fight today? Because I only had a limited amount of energy each day, and so I had to really make sure that my efforts were practical. Now, I had a little bit of joy. Yes, in abuse, joy. I loved Lego. Some of you around here may have also loved Lego. Now, for most of you, you hate Lego because you've stepped on them. <laughs> I loved forgetting to pick up my Legos. <laughs> now, that might sound very vengeful, and if I was still doing that today at 28, it absolutely would be. But in the moment, it got me through the day. Man's Search for Meaning is an important book to me because when I was able to get out of that situation and start to go through the process of healing, it was one of the first gifts that somebody who was a hero in my life gave to me. Janelle, a counselor here in Vancouver that I was seeing, the first Christmas of being in the city gave me this book. And it's a really interesting book. If you've ever gone to old bookstores where somebody's already used a book, and then you see the highlighted sections and you see the little quotes, that makes books really awesome, especially when they're Viktor Frankl's books. And this mattered to me because for the first time in my life, I felt like somebody cared. And from then on, I had a completely different perspective on what a hero is. Six years old, spandex, tights, hero. <laughs> Today, each and every one of you has the potential, or is already, I'm sure you are, a hero. Because you create space. Now, what do I mean by create space? We live in a world that is incredibly busy. How many of you in the last week, when asked, how are you, I'm busy? <laughs> what does that even mean? Does that mean that you procrastinate a lot? That's what it would mean if I say it. <laughs> Does it mean that you're too busy for them? As soon as you say, I'm too busy or I'm busy, you're closing the door on creating space. Now, no matter what was going on in that other person's life, I guarantee you they're probably not going to talk to you about it. Now, that's detrimental to us in a lot of areas because it means that we just lost an opportunity to learn. It means we lost an opportunity to connect. And when we're busy, one of the most important things we need is connection. And so I think about that, and I think about our culture, and I think about being busy, and I get very curious about this. And so I look back at what my life was like in childhood, and I ask, what did I learn? And the term that comes forward is emotional intelligence. And I argue today that emotional intelligence in 2015 is far more important than IQ. What you learn in a book does matter, but if you don't have the emotional intelligence to take action, to take accountability for what you now have knowledge in, then that knowledge means nothing. The other book that I have today is much more uh, relevant to right now, Coping with Anxiety. There's a lot of Coping with Anxiety books out there. There's probably a million of them for the millions of people who experience anxiety every day. For me, this book came from Jessica. And Jessica was my high school counselor. And Jessica is so much more than a high school counselor now. Jessica really is my chosen mom. Now, she's going to be embarrassed that I said this because calling her my chosen mom makes her feel very old, so in her mind, she's my chosen sister, but <laughs> between you and me, she's a mom. <laughs> now, Jessica's really smart, and Jessica's a perfect example of why connection is so important. Jessica's smart because I'm not succinct. I remember sitting in Jessica's office. I went back to my high school the year after I graduated. I know. Enter all the stereotypes here. But remember, I was a C-minus kid, not an A-plus kid. There was no reason for me to go back. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I sat there, unannounced, unscheduled, and I waited for her door to open. I sat there on a green couch, because Sardis Falcons, and I waited. And I would have waited all day. And she opened the door. She said, hi. I had a feeling that you'd come back which is always an interesting term to hear from somebody who's a counselor. <laughs> you had a feeling that I was going to come back. <laughs> so in grade 12, Jessica was actually away on maternity leave, but she'd been briefed on everything that happened. And grade 12 is when life exploded. Grade 12, my first hero was a peer. And that's why I say all of you are heroes. Because a peer made space for me. I said four words that set me free. My mom hits me. And from that day forward, my life would never be the same. And the best thing that a peer did in that situation was believe me. She got me to repeat myself, and she recommended, Aiden, I really think we should tell the teacher exactly what you just told me. And so I did. Now this is where Sardis Green is a detriment because it's like walking the green mile, and it's like hospital green. Who, who paints a school hospital green? I don't know. And so I told the teacher, nonetheless, hospital green and all, and that teacher did exactly what they should do in that situation. That teacher got me to open up more. They're, of course, creating a case. They know that victim services and child services and all these different thing, entities and agencies are going to come into play. And I told a counselor with the support of that teacher. I got out of the physical side of abuse. The emotional elements after that was an incredible amount of learning. I learned at first to ask the question, who am I? And like I said at the beginning, many of you have possibly asked this question in your own life. I took till I was about 19 to ask this question for the first time, so if you've asked it before then, winning. <laughs> but I had no idea. Like, where do you go from that? I mean, there's stats online, Lives are lost, suicide, alcoholism, re-abusing other people, which definitely was not me. I took it all out on myself. Who am I? And I started to realize that I was trying to be somebody for every different situation that I was in. I was trying to be a different person for every person that I knew in my life. In fact, I knew everybody in my life like a book. I knew all of their likes, their color, their passions, their dreams, and I talked to them up on it every single time, which isn't a bad thing, but I molded myself to them. So that wasn't who I was. Who do they think I am? Now, this is a little bit of a dark question because it's a deep rabbit hole that you're going to go down if you sit and ruminate on who do they think I am. And I want to leave with this. What society do you want to be a citizen of? Do you want to be in a society that is controlled by the technology we created? A society of emotional scarcity that in the workplace says things like, leave it at the door? a society that doesn't thrive off the personalities within it. In entrepreneurship, we say, there's got to be a better way. And there most definitely is. The better way is to retake our emotional authority. To be confident in ourselves. To recognize the beauty in the moment. And I'm at no point in my life more familiar than that than the wake of events that have happened this week. That life is incredibly vulnerable. And life is short. So what I'm going to do, and what I'm curious to see others do, is to make an effort every single day to have an authentic conversation with somebody else in your life in all of our lives. If you want to end suicide, if you want to lower emotional stressors and challenges, 
have an authentic conversation. It starts with hello, and it goes well beyond I'm fine. Now that's scary, and I believe you can get there, because we have to. And I thank you for creating the space to have an emotional conversation. Thank you.